gather in this place that we might receive the blessings that God has promised us and thank and praise Him for those blessings. We begin this morning by singing the hymn of invocation.
Almighty God, whose mercy has given his Son to die for you and for his sake, forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. You open your hand. Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. He covers the heavens with clouds. He prepares rain for the earth. He gives to the beasts their food. He delights not in the strength of a horse, nor in his pleasure in the legs of a man. But the Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him. Glory be to the Father and to the Son, as it was in the beginning, you open your hand,
by the Spirit. This too is the word of the Lord. We rise and sing together the common hallelujah and verse in preparation for the reading of the Holy Gospel.
mercy and peace be to you from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, then he shall reign as king and deal wisely, and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his days Judah will be saved, and Israel will dwell securely. And this is the name by which he will be called, The Lord is our righteousness. This is our text. It might be strange for someone to tell you, you need a king. Because we're Americans. And by rights, we're not supposed to like kings. We affirm a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. And the worldly politics, policies of our American systems is a check and balance system that is good and beneficial. It works. But before God Almighty himself, you need a king. God's kind of king is different from a human king. Now, kings of this world have usually not been all that great. Yes, there have been a few that are good, and there have been quite a few that aren't that great. Sometimes we have a little problem understanding that because, well, one of the places that we associate with kings and queens is Great Britain. That's probably the longest ruling queen of, in human existence has been Queen Elizabeth. And the fact of the matter is, is that, yeah, she seems like a good queen, although she's had her ups and downs too. But the biggest reason for that is because Great Britain has a parliamentary system. Where, quite frankly, the queen or the king doesn't have all that much power. They're responsible for saying that there's good government in their country, but they aren't the government of their country. And yet, when we think of kings and queens in the past, we can remember a great many of them that weren't that great, especially in, well, biblical times. The time of Holy Scripture, we can think of kings that were really pretty rotten. First of all, we probably think of the Pharaoh of Egypt, who is a king by another name, and how rotten he was to Israel. And then we think of the Assyrians and and the Romans and the Greeks and the Babylonians and all of that. In more recent times, we think of people who had dictatorships, which is kind of what a king is in its truest form. We think of such people as Adolf Hitler, uh, Joseph Stalin, Chairman Mao, Pol Pot, and others that were just horrible. Just terrible, terrible people. And so that's why in this country, when they threw off a king, even though it was a parliamentary king, they wrote it such so, so that there would never be a human being in charge. Because in this country, we choose to have rules or laws that rule this country, rather than individual people. Yes, we have a president, we have Congress, we have all of that. But it's the rules that we apply, or the laws that we apply, that are supposed to be applied to everybody equally. We have enough problems with that. But earthly kings just don't work out that well. They didn't in biblical times either. Even in Israel, which was supposed to be a theocracy, a theocracy where God was supposed to be the ruler of the kingdom. And even when they finally got their own way and wanted to be like the nations around them that had kings so that they could be more powerful and have a bigger kingdom, even then, things didn't work out so well. Their first kings were shepherd kings, literally. People who God took out of the fields who had been leading sheep or farming in one way or another, and were appointed to be kings, were anointed, 
for a prophet would anoint them with oil and make them king. And from the very beginning, God said, I'll give you a king because you want a king, but you won't like it very much. Because first of all, he's going to take all your property and money and tax it so that he has money for his stuff. Then he's going to take all your sons and put them in his army so he has an army. And he's going to take all your daughters and make them servants so that he has servants to take care of. So I'll give you a king, but you won't like it very much. And truth be told, their first king didn't work out that well. He was okay at first, but his problem that was that he was very jealous. And when God anointed a second king long before he was done reigning, Saul kind of turned around, mostly because of jealousy. The second king, David, is always kind of held up as the idyllic king. He was the second of the shepherd kings, literally taken from being a shepherd in the fields to being king over Israel. Well, it took him a long time to get there. Because most of the first part of his life he spent running away from Saul and hiding out and trying not to get killed. Then when he finally did get to be king, his problem was he played favorites. We don't see that as so much at first. But it's what's going to be the problem of this kingdom of God from then on because this is where the split starts. The split between the tribe of Judah and all the rest. Judah is favored because Judah supported David first. Even while Saul was still king, Judah started to support David. After David became king, then more often than not, he kind of favored Judah. Because it was his home tribe, and it's where Jerusalem is, and yeah. Then we come to the first king who was king because he was born to be a king. And that's Solomon. David's son. David's son by Bathsheba, of all things. We know the problems there. And Solomon was very wise, and he was a fairly good king, but unfortunately he still favored Judah. And after Solomon's reign is when the kingdom split. So you now have Judah and you have all the rest of them. The northern kingdom, Israel. And we know how that went and we see that and in Jeremiah we get to this point where this has all come to a head. By this point the northern kingdom basically doesn't exist anymore. It's been swallowed up by Egypt and then by Assyria, or what we call Babylon. And the southern kingdom, or Judah, also has that problem, is that they brought in the Babylonians to help them against the northern kingdom in Egypt. And, well, as big kingdoms go, when Babylon was done beating up on Egypt and Israel, they decided, well, we got this big army and we're here in Judah anyhow, so we might as well take them over too. At least that's how history might look at it. Although the prophets that come about that time make it very clear that the reason this is happening is because these earthly kings have not done well at all. And Judah no longer really follows God. And so God takes them into exile to chastise them and bring them back to him. And Jeremiah talks about what's going on here and what the problems are. And one of the problems he talks about is the fact that all these kings, all these shepherd kings that were supposed to shepherd the people of Israel, didn't. They didn't 
gathered the flocks together and protect them. They didn't establish God's righteousness in, in Judah or Israel, which was their only job. When you look at the kings of this, this theocracy, Israel, their only job was to establish God's righteousness, and not even David did that very well. And so God talks about these shepherds that have not shepherded the flocks, but have looked out for themselves and gotten out of what they can gain, and basically left the sheep to take care of themselves. Left the sheep to fight, you know, fight it out for themselves and do whatever they could do and stay alive any way that they could. Well, there's one problem with sheep. If you've ever had anything to do with sheep, Sheep aren't so much independent as they are, they just lose track of things. You watch sheep graze, you watch them, they'll all be grazing with their heads down and they're all heading off in different directions until you've got one over here, one over there, and one over there, and one here, and one there, and one, and they're not together all. Because they've just wandered apart. And unfortunately, that's what happened to God's kingdom of Israel. And that's unfortunately what happens to us all too often. We get our heads down, we're looking at our own stuff, we're doing our own thing, and pretty soon we look up and where did everybody go? What happened to everybody? All these people of God that were supposed to be together with me and kind of protecting me and taking care of me and helping me out and supporting each other and living under God's care and we're all off by ourselves. Reminds me very much of what I call the other portrait of the Good Shepherd. Yeah, we all know the one where Jesus is leading a flock of sheep and he's holding a little lamb in his arms and he, yeah, if you look closely, the, uh, the lamb has a thorn in its leg. But this is the other one where you're in the mountains and the good shepherd is leaning over a precipice, leaning over the edge of the cliff as far as he can possibly reach reaching out for a little lion who has fallen over the cliff and is on a little shelf. In the background there is a bunch of sheep. But there are storm clouds and there is an eagle circling around and things are not looking good at all. But it points out that that's our good shepherd. He comes and finds us wherever we are. So that whenever we act like sheep and wander off in our own direction doing our own things, he comes and gets us. And this is where God foretells this. This new shepherd king, the new Div Div Davidic Messiah, who is going to be a good king of his people and he is going to do justice and establish righteousness and he will gather his sheep together and he will protect them and care for them. It's the way things are supposed to be. It's what God originally wanted for his people. How after we fell into sin and all that stuff. But this is kind of where we come into the picture. Because not only is this Jesus going to take care of the flock of Israel, but he's also going to bring the Gentiles in too. He's also going to bring us, the people that weren't this quote, quote, quote unquote called people of God, that we might too live under this kingdom, under this good shepherd. 
Now this is the point where this also breaks down because what this good shepherd does first of all and most of all is dies for the sheep. Now in a human way that doesn't work at all. Whether you want to look at the, the picture of the shepherd or you want to look at the picture of a king, either one that is dead is of no use to, us, to whatever to his people. But this shepherd does it so that he might redeem his people and call them back to God. Make them worthy of the kingdom once again. Adopt them as his people forever. Not because what they have done or what we have done, but because of what he has done. He shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. And he will do it by establishing it himself. And that's why we get down to that final line where it says, The Lord is our righteousness. Now if you notice, this is the Old Testament, and that Lord is all in capital letters. So this is the divine name of God. Yahweh is our righteousness. He is that He is, the one who will never change in that unchangeable nature has redeemed us and brought us back to Himself for all eternity. To wander no more. To be in green pastures with no dangers forever. To follow Him where He leads us the true shepherd of his people. Because that's what he's established. The righteousness of God. Because he is our righteousness. Amen. And the peace of God which surpasses all human understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus unto eternal life. Amen. Shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits to me? I will offer the sacrifice of thanksgiving and will call on the name of the Lord. The God of salvation and will call on the name of
Let your word rule in every house, uniting its members in forgiveness, and causing your Son to dwell in every heart through faith. Lord, in your mercy. O Lord of might, spare us and future generations from wickedness. Give blessings to our nation and its leaders to rule according to your good pleasure. Protect the members of our armed forces, police, and every other public servants. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Heavenly Father, through your Son and his reconciling death, we receive all good gifts, healing, and sustenance. We bring before you the sick and those in need, especially Brandon, Betty and Daniel, Vitra, Rick, June, June, Judy, Cheryl, Aaron, Daniel, Terry, Michelle, and Janet, and those who we name in our hearts before you. Also, we pray for the long-term homebound and those in nursing homes, including Vitra, Rick, June, and June. Give them healing and protection and encourage them in the midst of this life by the recognition of your fatherly providence known in Christ Jesus our Savior, Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. All these things and whatever else you know we need, grant us, Father, for the sake of him who died and rose again and now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated and we sing the communion here.
we continue with the liturgy of communion. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and all places give thanks to you. Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven,
give thanks to Almighty God that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift, and we implore you of your mercy, you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.